Um, uh, my name is Rossella Ricobono. I'm one of the team of the um, cultural association called Il Pietrisco, uh, which is um, um, it's an international association that uh, studies uh, poetry, prose, and cinema. And um, uh, we were born in um, on the 24th of December 2020, so we're a very new association, and, and we've been doing a little bit of work on poetry and on prose, and tonight is actually the inaugural lecture uh, for the cinema section that um, um, you know, it's a pleasure to for us to have um, Anthony Quinn, Dr. Anthony Quinn, opening uh, this section with his lecture on uh, uh, Juliet on film. Uh, so I'm going to introduce briefly um, Tony, and then I'm going to uh, leave him the floor um, for his talk. So Anthony Quinn lives in Edinburgh. He has a lifelong interest in film and worked in cinema before becoming deputy manager of the Edinburgh International Film Festival. He undertook an honors degree in literatures in uh, English at the, uh, at the Open University, which focused on literature from a number of nations, as well as the detailed study of the origins and structure of the English language. His final year at university was dedicated entirely to Shakespeare. He then undertook a master's and a PhD at the University of Edinburgh on Shakespeare on film. He graduated in 2014. He has worked for the National Library of Scotland and for the Scottish Catholic Archive. He recently jointly headed a course on major themes in William Shakespeare um, as interpreted and from the perspective of some works of Thomas Aquinas. He is retired and works in his local high school tutoring students and special, um, with special needs. And um, how I met uh, Tony was exactly through the course on Shakespeare and, um, um, and Thomas Aquinas, uh, probably around maybe um, six to eight months ago, that he uh, taught um, for the Archdiocese of St Andrews and Edinburgh. Uh, and um, immediately when I heard him speak, I, I just, um, I heard a very good speaker um, with very good um, authentic research and um, a good sense of humor and, um, and, 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 and a humble, you know, good speaker, but humble at the same time. And, um, and I'm trying not to laugh here, sorry. <laughs> I just felt that, you know, that was enough for me to say, I need to invite him to be part of Ipiatrisco. We were looking for a, an expert on Shakespeare and, you know, with the film as well on top, we just got two birds with one stone. And so it's a pleasure, real pleasure to have Anthony um, speaking about Julian to, on film 1916 to 1996. So I'm going to be, mute myself and I'm going to leave the floor to Tony. Thanks, Tony. Okay, thank you very much for selling that lovely and undeserved introduction. What we're doing tonight is a sort of teaser trailer for four other lectures over the next year focusing on the films from 1936, 1954, 1968 and 1996. So I apologise in advance, although we'll be touching on a lot of subjects in these films, we don't have time to cover them all, we're going to race through things. And I've got a series of illustrations to make it easier. Uh, and it's film is uh, a visual medium. So it's important you see rather than just listen to someone describing something. So we'll crack on because there's a lot to do and hopefully we'll have time for plenty of questions at the end. Now, um, 1916 was the 300th anniversary of the death of Shakespeare, and Hollywood <clears throat> wanted to commemorate this. So two major film studios decided they were going to make a feature film of a Shakespeare film, which had never been done before, for release throughout the Western world. They both chose Romeo and Juliet. Of all the plays in Shakespeare's canon, that's the one they chose. And you have to ask why. Well, the first one, which we're looking at just now, was from Metro, Metro Gold Major, and that starred Beverly Bain and Francis X. Bushman. Bushman was a huge star at the time. He was known as the king of the movies. That's actually on his gravestone. And he was a big draw for this. Now, he got to choose his Juliet, and he chose Beverly uh, Bain because they'd worked together a few times, but also because they were in the midst of a very torrid affair which had been kept quiet from the public. 
he lived at home on a ranch in California with his wife, five children, and 129 Great Dane dogs. And it was written into his contract that wherever he went, at least five dogs went with him. Now, Metro chose, I think, Romeo and Juliet because you have to remember, it was silent movies. It's a visual medium. And the most visually um, recognisable scene in all of Shakespeare is a girl on the balcony. The most recognised line, famous line, is probably to be or not to be in all of Shakespeare's canon. But visually, it's a girl on the balcony. So they chose Romeo and Juliet. And they made a, quite a good job of it, apparently. The second film was made by Fox. And they chose Romeo and Juliet because Metro had chosen Romeo and Juliet. They were doing it on the cheap. They'd actually bribe people at um, Metro to give them some of the intertitles uh, to use on their film. They set the film sets to look similar to the Metro one. And uh, they hired the person to play Romeo, name of Harry Hilliard, purely because he looked like Francis X. Bushman. As Juliet, they had Theda Barra, who was seen um, figure four there in the middle. She was an early sex symbol in the cinema. They tried to make it an appealing sort of racy version of Romeo and Juliet. Theda Barra is the actress for whom the term vamp was coined in some of her early racy stuff, wore very slinky outfits. So she was a, a major draw. And uh, Fox actually, I think, told you, they, they bribed people at Metro to steal the intertitles, the subtitles you get in silent movies. They actually stole them from Metro and put them on their own film. So when uh, Francis Bushman went to see this version of the film, Harry Hilliard, he was surprised to see his own intertitles on the film. Both films were about eight reels long, which was you know, quite extensive at the time. Most films are one or two reels. They were both successes, but they've both been lost, so we can't really say much more about that. Um, Figure five, if you look at, this is strange, and this refers, go into this more detail, 1936 film. This is Mrs. Pat Campbell, a very famous actress. Now, she played um, Juliet to Ford Robertson as Romeo in 1895, that's where this is from. And she has a small part in 1936 film. I think you look at this picture here in figure five, and you go back up to figure one, and it's almost identical. You think it was the same picture because there was a very stylized and set way of performing Romeo and Juliet on stage, which transferred to screen. So the two films were made in 1916. That was it done. They had done, Hollywood had done its homage to William Shakespeare, and it was all done. So nothing happened for the next 20 years. So we made them go back and make a major version of Romeo and Juliet in 1936. And it was this. Midsummer Night's Dream, 1935. This was the first major film of the talkie era. And it was a big success. And you can see there why it was a success. There were three things that stand out. There's Max Reinhardt, who directed And he actually based this on his stage production, which was a huge hit at the Hollywood Bowl. Also, you see there the name William Shakespeare, music by Mendelssohn. So that's the big names to draw the public. You can see the poster, fantastic poster, very sensuous woman. The film's got quite a lot of that in it, you know, nymphs running about and flowing robes in the forest and stuff. And it was packed with stars. You had Olivia de Havilland, who was the star of the stage show, Dick Powell, Joe E. Brown, James Cagney, Mickey Rooney. This film was a big success. And it still stands up almost 100 years later if you get a chance to watch this film. It's a good film. There's a scene in, there's bits in this film where they put glitter in the forests and Zeffirelli tried to copy this later. We'll talk about that <clears throat> when we come to Zeffirelli. So there was a lot of jealousy in Hollywood at the time. When this film came out, they said, we are the guardians of Shakespeare. We are the people who can bring art to the people. And um, MGM, the nose was out of joint. They were the ones who'd made the, the one with uh, Francis X. Bushman. So they decided they were going to make an even better Shakespeare film. And this was fronted by Irving Thalberg, big producer in Holland at the time, married to Norma Shearer. 
It was his ambition in life, not hers, to have his wife as the number one star in Hollywood and to have her play Juliet. She didn't want to play Juliet. He pushed for it. Uh, they released a brochure at the time promoting this as the first Romeo and Juliet film ever, which we know was nonsense. There were lots of short silent versions. There were two full silent versions. And um, the picture you see there in figure seven is actually from the 1936 souvenir brochure. And it says there, Norma Shearer, the first screen Juliet, which was nonsense. Figure eight shows Norma Shearer herself playing Juliet in... Uh, a film from 1929, the Hollywood Review, Review of 1929, which was to promote sound in film. So that was nonsense, but it was all marketing at this point. So we move on. Norma Shearer was, and still remains, the only genuine A-listed Hollywood, female Hollywood star to play Juliet at the time of the film. Claire Danes is a huge star now, but at the time she made the film, she wasn't. Norma Shearer was a big, big star. Now, this was done as bankability to bring uh, the public to the film. It's a huge amount of publicity, but they ran into a problem they hadn't foreseen at the time. Censorship. Censorship, huge issue at the time, which we can't go into in too much detail at the moment. But Norma Shearer had played <clears throat> this sort of role in a number of films where she goes off and has affairs with married men always wearing these outfits, great outfits by Adrian. And the Catholic League of Decency took a stand against films that were coming out. There's a whole lecture on censorship, but the nux of the matter is there already was, and there has been from the early days of Hollywood, self-censorship in place. Hollywood were just, were just ignoring it. There's a myth that there was nothing in place. It was in place. They just ignored it. Because violent films, films with gangsters, racy films, that's what the public wanted to see. That's what they paid the money for. It was very profitable. The Catholic League of Decency started a campaign, uh, took out an advert in Time magazine, condemning certain films and one or two actresses. But they singled out Norma Shearer because she had done a number of films and actually put at the end of the thing in the Time magazine we strongly recommend you avoid seeing any film starring Norma Shearer. Now, this upset her husband, Irving Thalberg, tremendously. So he went on the offensive, which then upped the odds and the Catholic League of Decency brought in the big guns. They brought in two cardinals and an archbishop and they expanded so that they were no longer just the Catholic League of Decency, they were the League of Decency, which brought in the Methodists, Seventh-day Adventists, and it became a very, very powerful lobby. They boycotted cinemas. They had rallies, thousands and thousands of people, door-to-door -door petitions. And it was very, very effective. They started boycotting cinemas and profits from the cinemas went down 40% straight away and continued to climb. And it became apparent to the movie studios, literally hundreds and hundreds of cinemas were going to go under in a matter of weeks unless a deal could be struck. So they made a, a deal with um, a person called Breen, Joseph Breen, who had run the Catholic League of Decency and he became the man who gave the okay for films to be shown in cinema. No film would be, would be shown on a cinema screen without his personal approval. Now, the next few figures are quite interesting. Figures 10, 11, 12, and 13. In an effort to quote favour with Joseph Green and at the same time soften Norma Shearer's image as a sex symbol, as a sultry woman to try and make her chaste and innocent, they went to great lengths. This is an original promotional photograph. As you can see the date, I don't know if you can see it there, from 1936. The hairstyle, this is the hairstyle that Norma Shearer wore in the film. And this explains here, it was copied meticulously from this figure 12. The angel in Fra Angelico's The Annunciation. This was done to imbibe Juliet and Norma Shearer with an air of purity, innocence, closeness to God, 
And all this was done to sell the film to Joseph Green. Joseph Green was very much aware, he was a very clever man, but he was fully aware that in the text of Romeo and Juliet, Juliet, who's not quite 14, marries and has camel knowledge with her husband. That was not going to happen in the film. There is no reference to Juliet's age in this film at any point. All the actors and actresses in the film are of a similar age or older to Juliet. Norma Shearer was 34 at the time, married, two children. You wouldn't think that was the ideal preparation for playing Juliet, but all her co-stars um, were in their 40s or 50s. And it really didn't make much difference from that point of view. If everyone's on the same age group, there's no real contrast. But this is partly what um, we're talking about with Pat Campbell, because in an effort to make sure that everyone looked the same, but no one looked younger, uh, sorry, yeah, no one looked younger than Norma Shearer, all the actresses were caked in green makeup. Because the film was shown in black and white, it didn't, the green didn't show up. This was done. They also did tricks with lighting, called in specialist lighting people to make his wife look younger and chaste and innocent. So that was done deliberately and it seemed to work. And move on to figure 14. Now, figure 14 is, this is the part in the play where marriage is proposed to Juliet from her mother and the nurse. This film set the tone of how this scene has been played virtually in every film and most stage productions ever since. It's played purely for laughs because the nurse is coarse, the nurse is stupid, she says daft things, and she overacts. The overacting comes from this scene. This was um, her Edna Mae Oliver, character actress, the one on the right. And she was told, because there are a lot of comedy actors in The Midsummer Night's Dream, and because this is a tragedy, they were told, try and jolly this up, try and make it as funny as you can, where you can. And they ruined this scene. This is a hugely important scene. In the scene, in Shakespeare's play, you have the three ages of women in Shakespeare's time. Young, middle-aged and old. Juliet Shaw, her mother's middle-aged. The nurse is old. This is why she says confusing things, because she's old. There's further references in the play about her size, about her lack of teeth, uh, about her being old. So you've got the three ages of women in Shakespeare's time. But you also have, crucially, the three stages of a woman's life in Shakespeare's time. Maiden, wife, and widow. This is the path that Juliet's life is expected to follow. And it's all going well. At this point, marriage is proposed to Paris, who's a very good catch. Everyone's happy. Everything seems to be going according to plan until she meets Juliet, until she meets Romeo, and life goes off the rails. So that's what happens there. So, figure 15 is a brilliant picture on the right is the character of Rosaline in the 1936 film. I always think she's wandered off the set from uh, Flash Gordon, that brilliant head game. Rosaline does not appear in Shakespeare's play. She's mentioned, she's referred to, but she does not appear. Rosaline appeared in the two silent versions, and she appears in this film, and she appears in the 1954 version and the 1968 version, which we'll come to later on. This is quite interesting because a little bit of history of this particular actress. Uh, this actress is, her name is, where is it? I've got it here, Good. Catherine DeMille. Now she's the adopted daughter of Cecil B. DeMille. And she later went on and married Hollywood star Anthony Quinn. No relation. And by coincidence, the big dance sequence in this film, 1936, Romeo and Juliet, uh, was choreographed by her cousin, Agnes DeMille, who was the daughter of William C. DeMille. So there's a lot of family connections there. The dance sequence, which you can see here, in figure 16, is absolutely lavish. It lasts about 14 minutes. And when you look at it just now, it looks faintly ridiculous. But the whole thing is done purely to accentuate Norma Shearer as the top Hollywood star. She has all these handmaidens around her, as you can see. They circle her, she dances through the middle. They kneel before her, uh, they praise her. The dresses were all designed 
so that Norma Shearer was quite short, that no one looked taller than her with the shape of the dress. But also the thing has been, um, which referred to, it looks like a marriage scene. She's in white, there's all these handmaids as, as, as bridesmaids, and the whole thing is done as if a running theme throughout the film, the Virgin Mary, Bride of Christ. This is another subtle version to it, and another way to keep the purity angle pushed towards the former. Everything's chaste, everything's fine. Deviation from that, as we can see, figure 17 and 18. These are two illustrations which they had to put forward to, uh, to Breen beforehand to get the okay, this will be acceptable. Now on the left, you can see, this is the illustration they, they said, this is what Juliet will be wearing on the balcony. It looks, you know, a lot of layers there. It looks quite um, well buttoned up. It's quite solid. But the one on the right, which they released just after the film was released in the souvenir boat to promote the film, looking far more flimsy, almost see-through. There's a hint of a breast and even a nipple there. This was, again, to try and uh, get the audience in. But this illustration on the right came out after the film had been given approval, not before. The balcony scene was the focal point for this entire film. They made that thing. Now, this is very interesting here because figures 19 and 20, the balcony, figure 20 shows the balcony as it appears in the film. Figure 19 shows what it's been copied from. This is not a balcony at all. It's an external pulpit at a cathedral in Prato in southern Italy. I apologise for my mispronunciations of everything Italian in this talk. Designed by Italian architect uh, Bartolomo Michelosi and decorated by Donatello. Before they made this film, they sent people to Italy to take thousands and thousands of photographs. Took thousands of photographs and they copied swords, um, suits of armour, everything they could think of, jewellery, costumes, everything they could think. And of all the places they visited, they chose this as the balcony, and it wasn't a coincidence. Because this balcony in the cathedral, you can see in figure 21, there's a relic within this cathedral, a supposed relic of the Virgin Mary. Now, Joseph Green, I think I'd said, was educated by the Jesuits. He had a particular devotion to the Virgin Mary. From this balcony, five days a year, still to this day, they exhibit what's supposed to be the girdle of the Virgin Mary. By the girdle, I mean the, the cord that was tied around her waist. And this is showing up. So they did this again to soften Joseph Green's approach to the film, once again associating Juliet with the Virgin Mary. And it seems to have worked. So that, that seemed to go. A lot of power was given to Joseph Breen. They had to keep him on side. This was a hugely expensive film at the time, and they needed the OK. So that was going OK. Figure 22, this is a death scene in 1936. Now, most of the death scenes in Romeo and Juliet are quite pretty to look at. There's nothing harsh about them at all. Um, as you can see here, soft focus, she's wearing a tiara, wearing the same dress that was the wedding dress. And it's all, always designed at this point to make the film primarily a love story. Always a love story, never a tragedy. Whereas it's actually the other way around. It's a tragedy. The play is a tragedy that is voiced through a love story. But they're selling movies to the public. They thought Shakespeare was a bit of a hard sell. So they made this more of a woman's weeping. And it worked quite well. The film was a, was a success, although not the success they hoped for. There are different versions to how much money they made, and the impression is they give one figure to the public and they give another figure to the taxman. But the film appears to have been a success, but not as big as they hoped it would be. So we move on to the next film, and I'm sorry for rushing through this. 1954. Now you can see here, figure 23 is Grace Kelly and High Moon. And on the right here, figure 24, is Susan Gentile. A very, very strong similarity. This is not a coincidence. Renato Castellani of Castellani. Um, Neorealism was his background, and he wanted um, 
a natural free acting uh, Juliet, someone who was fresh, was unknown, but at the same time could have a film star's look. Susan Shental was chosen after being spotted in the Caprice restaurant in London. There's a lot of mythology around this, that she was spotted and given the part straight away. She wasn't. She was spotted, he'd left instructions with the maitre d', Mario. If you see someone matching this description, and he gave him a description, phone me at this number. Mario spotted Susan Shental. She was attending um, secretarial college. She was there with her uh, younger sister and her parents. He got in touch with the director who came down. She was offered an audition for the film. At first, they thought, uh, thought it was a joke, but they persisted, no, come along to the audition. In total, she had three different auditions for the film. The final audition was with Lawrence Harvey. Now, at the time, Susan Shentel, she wasn't so much an unknown actress as not even an untried actress. She wasn't an actress at all. There was a lot of bad press about this, saying it shouldn't be allowed. And it was, it was, it was wrong to do this to Shakespeare, and it was against the Shakespeare canon, etc. What all the press failed to catch on was that the person who played Romeo, Lawrence Harvey, had been spotted in the very same restaurant three weeks before. And he was offered the part purely on his looks. So it seemed to be criticism for one part, but not for the other. So the film itself was the first Romeo and Juliet film to be shot uh, out with a studio. They went to Italy, partly because colour film was a lot cheaper in Italy, an awful lot cheaper than you could do it in the UK. This became uh, a drawback for the director who became obsessed with colour. Prior to being a director, he'd studied architecture and it shows in the film. Architecture tends to overwhelm a lot of the film. At the same time, the films he had done before, uh, neorealism films, there are people who are the freedom of the city, the urchins who live in the Colosseum, they, they can go anywhere and it's reflected in this film. Romeo has the freedom to go wherever he wants and his friends and they do that throughout the film. Juliet is repeatedly filmed behind bars in stone rooms. The director comes back to the themes of concrete, stone and iron grills as a sense of imprisonment and claustrophobia. In this he echoes uh, what uh, Orson Welles had done uh, earlier on 1948 with Macbeth. And in these films, Juliet, her eyes are cast downward throughout the whole thing. Subjugation. The initial scene, uh, a bit of it's quite reminiscent of To Catch a Thief, where Cary Grant is invited uh, by Grace Kelly's mother to make a pass at her. That's what happens here um, with Paris in this film. Once again, we return to the character of Rosaline. Now, this is quite interesting because. Rosaline in 1954, not only appears in the film, she's actually given lines to speak, which you know, is, is quite unheard of. 1936, Rosaline doesn't say anything. She sort of waves and looks, she doesn't actually do anything. And this is interesting because this is because the hairstyle on Rosaline here is a deliberate copy from uh, Pisanello's fresco of St. George, and the Princess of Trebizond in the Church of St. Anastasia in Verona. Throughout this film, overwhelming the film really, are numerous, countless references to the Italian origins of Romeo and Juliet. This came about in 1952. They were holding a press conference in London with the director and with the heads of the studio, Frank Studio, uh, who had bought the Odeon Cinema chain to premiere this film, to showcase this film. This was a huge release at the time. It was the most expensive, it was a British Italian film, but it was the most expensive British film made at this point. And they were doing a sort of search for Scarlett O'Hara to try and promote the film at this press conference. And one of the journalists asked a very reasonable question, how much of Shakespeare's text will you actually be using in the film? 
because most directors use between 35, 55% of any play because, because of film, you can cut a lot of stuff out. Much to everyone's surprise, not least the backers of the film, he said, I won't be using any of Shakespeare's text, not one word. I'll be basing this on the Italian folk tales of uh, Bandello, De Porto, Masuccio, and I will be writing the script myself. This did not go down well at all. The director was taken into a, a room and spoken to directly saying, we are making Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. We are promoting Shakespeare's Juliet. We are selling Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. The public are coming to see Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, not the Suchos, the Portos, Mandelos. That is the film that will be made either by you or someone else. So he reluctantly agreed to go along with Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. But throughout the film, there are countless references back to the Italian origins and everything to do with Italy in this film, which we'll go into in more detail on the 1954 film. Now, 28 and 29, how much of a coincidence is this if it is a coincidence? The fresco from the 1936 film on which Juliet's hair was modelled appears in this film. Quite clumsily done, as if he just happens to be sitting in front of it. Uh, but it's the same thing, the same another association with uh, chastity, virginity, heavenliness and goodliness. It's all done there. Uh, and also on the right, it's a publicity shot from 1954. This shot does not appear in the film, but again, they try to make this association. And interesting enough, you can see the outfit where worn there by Friar Lawrence. I actually got in touch with the Vatican about this because it didn't match anything that I could find of any order. So I wrote to the Vatican and they come back to me and said, confirmed, this habit does not exist. It's an amalgamation of different orders done, I think, from different versions of Italian things that the, the director put in. Another example, of going back to the Italian versions is this scene here. Figure 31 on the right, this is Juliet's wedding. She's kneeling before the grate in the window and she's got a lily and she's in front of a cross. On the left, again, apologies for pronunciation. This is an illustration by Giambattista Gigola and it shows Romeo and Juliet kissing through the open grill. This was written, this was uh, created for an early version of Romeo and Juliet in the Italian folk versions. That scene is copied very much so here. She's even... The critics at the time got this wrong. They thought this was a reference to... Romeo's on the other side of the grill, in case you're wondering. They thought this was a reference to Midsummer Night's Dream, the lovers Pyramus and Thisbe and the hole in the wall. It was actually another direct association from the director to move back to the Italian folk tales. Uh, and we're going on again, figures 32, 33, and 34. This is where the lily comes in. The marriage scene continues, and it forms an image that's similar to another frangelical painting, St. Lawrence and the Jailer, which you see here on the left. But a man is seen kneeling beside the friar as viewed through the iron grill of the cell door. In the film, we see Shakespeare's Friar Lawrence being replaced by Fran Jellico's St. Lawrence, as Romeo kneels before him. Now, this can be depicted not only as another reference to Fran Jellico's work and an insertion of more Christian iconography, but also as another example of using architecture to suggest imprisonment. It does this throughout the film. The film also incorporates another theme, uh, oh, sorry, going back to the lily, this is St. Dominic. He's often portrayed with a lily in a book, and that was done here rather clumsily. In the film, if you see the film, the lily is given to Juliet by the friar, and it's quite symbolic and quite clumsy, but that's, that's what's done for that. Another reference to the film, which I don't have a picture of, I couldn't get off the screen, I apologise. The final seen the funeral uh, 
of Romeo and Juliet, you have all these bishops coming in from the side in full regalia, which is quite silly because it's you know, obviously it's the morning after the bodies are found in the tomb and suddenly all these bishops appear. And uh, this was done, <clears throat> pardon me, to copy this painting. Uh, this painting is Botticelli's, so the dress was Botticelli's Flora. The, uh, I'm trying to find the name of the painting, The Funeral of St. Ursula. The costumes the bishops wear are copied from this painting. It could also be a reference to the two lovers' initial meeting. For the full title of the painting is The Martyrdom of the Pilgrims and the Funeral of St. Ursula. And the two meet, they have this whole thing about pilgrims, palm to palm. So that was another reference to it. Uh, but ultimately, the film was not a success for a number of reasons. The acting styles between uh, the naturalistic Susan Chantal and the very stagey Lawrence Harvey. He was very much a stage actor and tried his best to be John Gielgud. In fact, the very first words he says in the film, it's an impersonation of Gielgud. He says, is the day so young? Sing song voice. And he continues this through the film and the two styles clash, it doesn't work. The director's obsession with Technicolor became a big thing. He carried with him a little palette, like a paint palette you would get if you're picking colours for your house, all the different colours, to make sure the costumes didn't clash. There are countless costume changes in this film, and each costume becomes progressively more ridiculous than the one before. Romeo enters the banquet in one costume and leaves in a completely different costume. This goes out through the film. It was a good idea. I think had he been allowed to make an Italian folk version, it could have been very interesting. Had he stuck entirely to Shakespeare's text, it could have been interesting. In the film, he actually includes some of his own text that he'd written himself. People didn't pick up at the time. And it all becomes a bit top heavy, a bit too detailed, and it doesn't quite work, which is a shame. It's a very interesting film. But uh, it came and it went. It was a big success at the time, particularly in Italy. Uh, but after that, it just seemed to disappear from view. So we move on, so I'm rushing the time here, to 1968. Juliet Conquers the World, Franco Zeffirelli's film. Lavish film, beautiful film, brilliantly made. It, it is, for many people, the definitive film version of Romeo and Juliet. Not everyone's aware the film is based on his own successful stage production, 1960 to 1961. 36 is Judy Dench and John Shred. And just below that, you see the same balcony scene uh, with Leonard Whiting and Olivia Hussey. Based on caution, the major change between the stage version and the film version was theme. In the stage production, it was out at the time the Berlin Wall was going up, so it was very political. It was all about conflict, working together to overcome co conflict. By the time the film comes out, the stage production showed the world. It's a huge success. Actually, he was given the same budget uh, as the 1936 film, $500,000. The time it came to 1968, the theme is the summer of love, and the whole thing is a celebration of youth and beauty, which it does exceedingly well. Zeffirelli was obsessed with youth and beauty. He wrote articles about how uh, he wanted to capture these young, beautiful people on film so they would be immortalised in celluloid. He could not think of anything worse than them ageing, their body sagging and growing old. He chose Leonard Whiting, he says, because, and he wrote in his biography, autobiography, he was the most beautiful youth he had ever seen. It's interesting that in Zeffirelli's earlier part of his career, he had done some uh, scene painting for opera, that's how he started out. He also did some acting. And if you find uh, a photograph of a young Franco Zeffirelli and you look at Leonard Whiting. There's quite a strong similarity. So I don't know how much of it was unconscious vanity or conscious vanity, but 
they got the part. Interestingly enough, Leonard Whiting was not first choice for Romeo. First choice was Paul McCartney. He was trying to sell it. Paul McCartney, the icon of youth and beauty at the time, 1967-68, was offered a part and turned it down. Olivia Hussey was not first choice either. Numerous actors, actresses applied for the role, including Angelica Houston. But the part was given to an un at this, he refuses to name who it was, and I haven't found out who it was, an actress who had long golden locks of hair. And on the first day of rehearsal, she turned up and she'd had her hair cut short. Now, Zeffirelli had previous with this, he would not allow anyone in stage production to wear wigs. He did not allow anyone to wear wigs because he was of the opinion, if you have a wig, you're showing it off. You know, you're, you're turning this way and that way and it's not natural. So the girl was sacked and Olivia Hussey was brought back for a, another screen test. By this time, he writes that she had lost some of her puppy fat. She had a bad habit of biting a nail. She'd given that up and uh, she got the role. Figure 39 is the Rosaline character, 1968. I mean, here are being mentioned, being uh, announced as such as she enters the banquet. Now, it's quite interesting because in all these films, we see the same trait. We see a, a, a young, beautiful person playing Rosaline, who is then replaced by an even more beautiful person playing Juliet, even though Rosaline does not appear in the play. Um, here she's playful, confident, flirtatious. She smiles with Romeo as she dances. She then dances towards the camera and she turns around uh, and her gown obscures the camera's view. And what happens after that is, for me, the defining moment in Zeffirelli's film. The presentation of Juliet. At this point, the music has been building to a crescendo. It stops suddenly which simultaneously isolates and highlights this moment. We hear the introduction of a more tender melody and Julia appears in a full length shot, symbolically and physically replacing the departed Rosaline. She's wearing a long crimson gown and her face is framed between the two male guests, one of whom actively encourages the households as well as the audience, you can see the chap on the left there, to applaud her entrance. This is Juliet being presented to the world as a young woman. Now, the film changes dramatically. We cut to Romeo at this point. He's been watching, he pulls his mask down. Uh, he doesn't want to be seen, but the whole costume, Juliet's costume, is designed to bring attention to her face. And what happens at this point is actually symbolic of Italian love poetry of the time where the play is set. Uh, she's framed and shot in such a manner, she becomes the sole focus of the male gaze. Initially, Juliet's seen a long shot, gradually replaced by medium shots and then close-ups, firstly of her face, then it's more intimate. It becomes her eyes and her mouth. It's a methodical, progressive focus on the very blazon of Renaissance poetry. Where the body's broken down into parts for individual praise, before being brought back to the face, and then rapture poured upon the beauty. Now, this is done quite well because in a cinematic sense, and by moving the camera, the audience falls in love with Juliet at exactly the same time and pace as Juliet, as uh, Romeo does, which happens here. Now, this is quite, this is not actually from the film. This is from a rehearsal from the film, Figure 42. Uh, this film was guaranteed a worldwide success before it was even released. And this was because on June the 25th, 1967, approximately 80 million television viewers in 18 countries in the world watched a program called Our World. It's the first live satellite broadcast between all these nations and each nation was highlighting some aspect of their great culture. Uh, you had Picasso painting, Maria Callas singing, and from Britain, you had 
the Beatles singing All You Need Is Love. That's what that film comes from. It comes from this thing, Our World. Now, Zephyr Elliott knew some people in the Italian television and in the Italian government, and he managed to convince them that of all Italy's vast expanse of art and culture, the thing they should show to the world was him rehearsing these young people for his film of Romeo and Juliet, which was tremendous. It was supposed to be, it was promoted as being an intimate um, viewing of a rehearsal. Uh, so we were supposed to be quiet and watching what's going on, but it was no such thing. The rehearsal itself was rehearsed for three days solid. Every single hesitation, every single pause was practiced and repeated until it was perfect. So by the time this film came out, 80 million people throughout the world had already seen free trailers for it, had seen these young, beautiful people. It was assured that people wanted to see it. It was a huge success. As with the 1936 film, souvenir brochures, brochures uh, were printed. And in this one, quite often, there was a lot of flesh on show. As you can see, this was done the age, the summer of love. Zeffirelli was the first person to move beyond uh, Juliet being a male fantasy of a sex object in one way or another. In this film, she becomes also a sexual subject capable of her own knowing and of acting upon them, which she does. And we can see that in the banqueting scene where uh, Romeo kisses her. She greedily kisses him back. This is actual change in how Juliet has been portrayed up to this point. It's quite a fundamental change. But we also had, it went on a bit, Juliet as woman. The balcony scene in the film. It's hard to ignore. Uh, this is what uh, one of the people wrote at the time on Juliet's cleavage. It's all over this scene. And it was written, I'm quoting here, it is very hard to ignore the contraption which makes a spectacle of Olivia Hussey's pubescent bust strategically targeted by the camera as she leans over the balcony. The corset is technically an item of clothing, yet it creates a type of nudity. In its redesigning of the female figure, the corset winds up offering more cleavage to the eye than might be available when a woman is naked. When the corset wearer in question is scarcely a woman at all, like the 15-year-old Hussey, this enchantment effect becomes even more striking Come slightly disturbing as well. Juliet was 15 when they started filming this. She turned 16 during the filming. There's a very brief semi-nude scene. Juliet's breasts are exposed. That was the last scene that was filmed for this film and everyone was cleared off the set. But Olivia Hussey speaks about this in her uh, autobiography, The Girl on the Balcony. She was very shy about doing this. She didn't want to do it at first. Zeffirelli had a nickname for her, quite a coarse nickname about being big boobed, which he would shout out on set to get her to come in front of the camera. And it was only later on she realised that what he was doing, he was uh, getting her used to thinking of herself in a sexual way so that she became more used to it. It's quite doubtful as to how that would be done nowadays if it would be allowed, particularly with someone so young. Um, <clears throat> Juliet's death scene in the tomb. Now, again, this is a scene of beauty. The whole film is beautiful. Visually, it's stunning. The music's stunning. The music's done by Nino Rota, who went on to do The Godfather, which Seferelli was offered to direct at first. Um, and the tomb scene is bathed in paintings, uh, the light of Italian paintings. It's done deliberately. The, Cameraman studied Italian paintings and wanted, I think they were the Zumato, someone can tell me if it's wrong or not. Uh, you can see this happens when Romeo goes in, he has a flaming torch and he puts it just out of sight, out of camera shot on the left hand side. And then the lighting changes to a soft amber, very soft bathing, uh, flattering look on everyone in the film. And the whole thing becomes uh, a scene of beauty at this point. When Juliet awakes in the tomb, she finds her dead husband, she still manages to take off her skull cap and release 
or cascades of raven hair. Um, and the whole thing is done for beauty. She uh, plunges the dagger into her heaving bosom and sort of falls forward very dramatically. Beautifully done, quite sad. It is a love story above all else in this film and it works extremely well. It is a film of the time. Uh, the first time you see Romeo is actually wearing eyeliner, carrying a flower, flower power all the way through. It's a great film. It's a very, very enjoyable film. But that caused problems for Baz Luhrmann, which we'll go into not so much detail here, but later on. Uh, 1996. And the film starts off uh, with her police helicopters coming down towards the Statue of Christ, which is very reminiscent of the beginning of La Dolce Vita, Statue of Christ being carried by a helicopter. Um, now that is where uh, you can see in here that Christ is between the two buildings, almost separating the Montagues and the Capulets. And whereas in the Dolce Vita, people are giving up religion for a more indulgent lifestyle. Uh, here we see the same sort of thing, they're giving up religion. Actually, throughout the film, they use an awful lot of religious iconography, but it's done in a very coarse, cold manner. God is on our side sort of thing. And there's no real no real religion at the core of the film where there should be. The helicopter in question, and here it's the captain's helicopter. It's a police Bell Huey helicopter. The Bell Huey helicopter has these two blades, two rotating blades, and it makes a distinctive sound, which American audiences know full well from endless news footage from the Vietnam War, any siege at all, it's all of these helicopters. There's a lot of hostility here. Uh, I'm going to rush through some of these things. Baz Luhrmann was of the effect that he was challenging the Zephyrly approach to the film. And he was challenging it in a number of ways, not just the style of the film, but in our knowledge of the film. He approached the film that we all know that Romeo and Juliet die. So we're not going to pretend that they're not going to die. And he gives hints through footage and through quotes from other Shakespeare plays about death and destruction. And you see this at um, uh, the Gary scene and Tony's Gary scene. There were two scenes which really angered the critics. The shooter at the Gary scene, more fuel to the fire. Now that comes from Henry, Henry VI, part three. I need not add more fuel to your fire, for well I want you blaze to burn them out and the garage ends up being burnt, burnt to the ground. The scene which infuriated most people was the dance sequence. More than anything else, this brought out the ire. And the person playing Mercutio and Mercutio himself was ripped to shreds unjustly. Uh, he's, he's doing a thing to young hearts on free, bewigged, mini skirted, stocking, high heeled Mercutio. Um, now, this is the only enacted song and dance number in a film that's packed with music. What critics fail to point out at the time is this is only happening in Romeo's mind. He's taking the drug, Queen Mab drug, as it is in this film, and this is all in his mind. And it's a carnival of um, the grotesque, which we'll explore in more detail in the 1996 film. Figure 52 uh, and figure 53 together. We see this is another foreshadowing of death. This is the station of the cross. Christ dies on the cross. Uh, Tybalt has got horns and he's surrounded by two skeletons, the good thief and the bad thief. This is uh, a hint that there's going to be a violent death, but it's not anyway, it's Tybalt's own death, which we see in the next one, where he dies, arms outstretched like Christ, falls into the pool where that statue of Christ actually is. So that's what all that was. The, the addition of the horns is a little reference back to Zeffirelli, because when Tyrrell appears first in the Zeffirelli film, he's wearing a cap and the ears are folded up of the cap to make it look like it has horns. Tybalt's the bad guy. It's a very simple message. Another reference to death, I am thy pistol and thy friend, is a quote from the other Shakespeare we went to just now. This is the very gun that Juliet will use to kill herself with. It's Romeo's gun. 
and you see this poster throughout the song. Now, religious iconography in St Rose of Lima. This picture is outside Juliet's bedroom. We see it quite a lot. St Rose was a young girl who her parents were forced, forcing her to marry someone else, someone she did not want to marry, like Juliet. So she took a crown of thorns and disfigured her own face. So that's our reference to that. Now, as with Cifrelli, Claire Danes was not first choice for Juliet. First choice was Natalie Portman. And she was actually engaged and they shot the first scenes with Natalie Portman. And when they played them back, they didn't like what they saw because Natalie Portman, Portman is very small and very delicate. And uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is about six feet tall and he's quite broad and athletic. And the scenes they shot, they were worried it looked like he was molesting her. And they're very concerned again about the whole, going back to the 1936 film, the perceived age of Juliet of being underage. So she was dropped. Claire Danes had been a big success in this TV series called My So-Called Life. She played a person called uh, Angela Chase, Angel Chase, and this becomes a little joke throughout the film. This picture here, figure 56, is the figure in front of the DVD. And the first time we see Juliet in the film, she has her face down in the sink. Similarities here. In the first episode of My So-Called Life, Angel Chase is told by one of the cool girls at school that she has to change her hair, and Angel says, she means by change my hair, change my life. Symbolically, this is the night of the banquet. Juliet's life changes from that very point. She sees Romeo. Rosaline, this is what Baz Luhrmann does it differently from the film else. He chalks the name of Rosaline up on the board. Rosaline does not appear in this film. This is an understanding that he has that, and I think it works very well. In each of the films, as I said before, and the two silent films, Rosaline, young, beautiful, replaced by someone even more beautiful. And he was of the opinion that even if you judge a woman to be perfect, that very act of judgment is degrading to the woman and reinforces the phallocentric society that exists today and very much in the film world. So I thought that was very well done. We'll explore this later in the 1996 film. Figure 59. First hint of Juliet's independence is that she's spying on Romeo through the fish tank. He's not spying on her, a reversal of the male gaze. And she's doing this in the most intimate of places, public bathroom. And it's also beautifully shot and as there's, there's no dialogue, there's the music going on in the background. So they are forced to make this connection through the very close and intimate use of eye contact and it works extremely well. Now one of the themes we get in a lot of discussions on Shakespeare is, is uh, Mercutio in love, with, in love with Romeo, is Romeo in love with uh, Mercutio? Uh, Mercutio? Are they in denial? Can it be played different ways? An interesting thing here uh, is the, at the beach, everyone's parting, there's girls in bikinis, everyone's having a great time. And then Tybalt comes along for his confrontation with Mercutio. From that point, the background changes completely. All the party goers disappear. And in the background, if you watch the film, it is absolutely packed with leather-clad bikers and muscled sailors. Now, this is all very similar of the work by the Finnish artist Tauku Laxon, as you can see from some of his work here, which was very popular and became synonymous with late 20th century gay culture. Now, in this scene, it's a very interesting scene. Tibble walks Mercutio with the, the insinuation that he is having or has had or wishes to have a sexual relationship with Romeo. And Mercutio acts with fury. Interestingly enough, we don't know why he's reacting with fury. Because it's true, because it's false, because he does feel something for Romeo, but it's not reciprocated. We don't know. 
Now, that's something we talk about in the 1996 film, but it's very interesting because many people believe Romeo and Juliet regard it as the greatest heterosexual love story of all time. What if there is another element to it? That's quite interesting. Now, 62 and 63, this is where Baz Luhrmann's film, I believe, surpasses others in terms of Romeo and Juliet being a tragedy and not a love story. And it's not done sympathetically. It's also quite noticeable. It's a strange thing. The, the shootout scene at the garage, the amount of editing is, is incredible. There's a huge amount of edits. I can find the numbers for the, the talk on that. Uh, got fr and the film was degraded as being all run around, chop socky, hectic. But from that point in the film, the film gradually slows down to a very slow finale in the cathedral. A finale in a film which features police chases, guns and gangs. There's a very, very slow finale. That's highly unusual. Juliet wakes up. She sees all these empty signs of religious iconography and the silence and she begins to cry. Her face twists with anguish and everything she's realized, everything she's striven for is lost. Her breathing races in panic. She pulls up, she looks around at the ornamentation of death. This small detail, panic and fear, transforms this scene from what we've seen in previous films as overtly theatrical. Here, it is intensely personal. We're intruding. We feel we shouldn't be there. And at this point, she steadies her breathing. She looks around and she picks up Romeo's pistol. She's doing this because Juliet's life, she realizes at this point, her life's journey has come to an end. She has transformed from maiden to wife to widow. But she's done it not over 30 or 40 years, as we expected, but over a period of five days. That is part of the great tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. It is Juliet's tragedy. She has gone through this. She has nothing left. She then pulls the gun and puts it to her temple. And the audience is horrified because we hear the gun being cocked back, you know, echoing in the cathedral. And we become aware that we are about to witness a very real and a very violent death. And we can only look on as horror. She places the gun to her temple, looks to the heavens and pulls the trigger and the shot echoes around. Juliet's love may be eternal, but her life's journey reached its end. That is the very core of the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. It is one of Shakespeare's greatest tragedies. It's one of the most adaptable, it's one of the most flexible that people can use. And I think it's one of the greatest plays ever written. So thank you very much for listening to me race through that. And if you've got any questions, I will do my very best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tony. That, that was um, very rich, um, very interesting. And um, because you went through four films. Um, I apologize for the pace. I know I was going so far. Yeah. It's a teaser trailer for the other lectures. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, and you actually paused enough on each of the films, I think, to, you know, to kind of draw out the differences and the contrast between the four of them. So it worked really well. Um, so thanks again. And, you know, I'm going to open this with a question and then I, I would love to um, have people from the audience as well to ask questions. Uh, but I'll open it up just to break the ice. Um, and uh, if we stay on the same... Um, on the same uh, pictures that you're showing there. I'm really quite intrigued by, you know, because you've talked a lot uh, of um, contrast and um, influences between art, architecture, paintings, and, and the productions, the four different productions of Romeo and Juliet. And here on the second last picture, um, as well as all those beautiful candles um, that, you know, because it's not in, in a tomb, but it's in a cathedral, they, they set the atmosphere. But at the same time, there's Juliet next to the archangel um, 
um, not Gabriel, um, Michael, I believe that's the Archangel Michael, do you know? Because, um, you know, at the beginning she has wings and so the angel that you talked about, a joke about uh, the angel. Yeah. And there's that kind of, um, you know, kind of film kind of language of comparing her or setting her next to the angel, um, Archangel Michael, who has a sword. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, obviously she's not going to use a sword because she's got a pistol. It's, this is a postmodern, you know, 1990s film. Do you know anything about this? Because I thought that was quite... Um... Well, a lot of the religious iconography in this film, and it's everywhere. It's on waistcoats, it's on cars, it's in the police helicopter. It's all quite garish, and it's never more so garish when Romeo pushes over the, open the door of the cathedral. And interesting, it's the cathedral, it's not a tomb. So we get the hope that perhaps she's not quite dead yet. Um, and he opens the, the door to the cathedral and it's full of balloons and candle, candles and uh, huge ornamentation of uh, crosses made out of flowers. Very garish, like gangsters, like people who have a lot of money but no taste. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the only symbol of, for me, uh, religious iconography, which holds true meaning and is deeply personal, is on the inside of the ring that she has there on her, on her finger there. That's the ring that Romeo takes from his neck and, and puts on her finger while she's in the tomb. Because inside the ring is engraved Romeo and Juliet, but the and is not an ampersand, it's a cross. Okay. And that's how the title of the film was actually marketed. It wasn't, it wasn't Romeo with the word and, or it wasn't Romeo and the ampersand, and Romeo cross Juliet. Yeah. So that's an, an intensive part of that. Yeah. So it could have been a Romeo plus Juliet, but also interpreted in a religious yeah. way. And, and this scene definitely. Um, that's the next to, <coughs> to the Archangel. Because at the beginning, she's got wings, doesn't she? Yeah, the young thing was up. Well, at, at the bits, when we were introduced to Juliet at first, we hear her mother screaming for her. And the joke there is, um, playing the marriage of Figaro, the introduction to the marriage, the overture to the marriage of Figaro at that point. And when we cut to the scene of her in the bath, face down, like Angel Chase, mm -hmm. the music changes to another track called Angel by someone else. So she's this thing of angel of purity. And also the joke about the, the, the banquet, the fancy dress party is that Romeo's dressed as a knight. He's the knight in shining armor who's coming to rescue her from this golden tower where she's imprisoned. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's quite good. Yeah, I, I, I'm quite, also quite intrigued by, um, um, you know, for example, in the first, I, I've watched all the films, including the 2017 one. <laughs> I was sick a couple of weeks ago, I was so sick that I had to cancel my whole week. And um, I have to say that in the end, apart from not being well, I really enjoyed it because I watched so many films, including all the Romeo and Juliet's one. And um, I noticed that, um, um, you know, from the, the tragedy, from the, 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 the play where Romeo and Juliet um, hear each other's voices, and that's, that's quite clear in, you know, it says, I haven't yet heard a hundred of his words and I'm still, I'm already drunk with love for this. And that's one of, I can't, I can't quote the line properly, but basically it's a lot based on this encounter of voices, they fall in love with each other because of each other's voices. But there's a lot of seeing uh, in the first three films, the 1936, the 1954 and the 1968, Romeo sees Juliet. He has a mask, but she doesn't. But in this one, they don't see each other because of the, uh, the fish tank. Yeah. They kind of sense each other's presence. There's also a very interesting correlation. I, I don't have the figures here, but I can look them out for you. Is the the time between Romeo seeing Juliet and having the first kiss. Yeah. Because most of the films, uh, it's roughly the same, but in this film it's different. If you want, I'll find out the exact times, but it's, it's quite interesting. Okay, yeah. Very good. And the, 
the water, there's, there's a lot to be said about the water of symbolism in this film, which we don't have time to go into just now. A lot of people have written about it being of great religious significance in this film, mm -hmm. and it's not. Mm -hmm. And I know that because I've looked and looked and found an interview that Baz Luhrmann gave uh, to us, a local radio station in 1997, and he responded to a lot of the stuff about that being written. I mean, the, you look at it, you could say, you know, Tybalt falling into the pool of water mm -hmm. in front of the statue of Christ uh, after uh, after Romeo shoots him, he drops his gun, and the rain comes on symbolic to wash away his sins. Uh, and I think when Romeo falls into the pool, the very next line you should say in the play, but doesn't say in the film, is say them. Uh, I'll, I'll be new baptized. So you can see why this came about, but it wasn't the case of that at all. So myths go out of films all the time of what this means, what that means. Yeah. And people disagree. And everyone is free to disagree with me. This is just my opinion on stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we, we're not here to disagree with you, but uh, I suppose um, um, we all have different perception because it's... Um, you know, like kind of the imaging cinema is universal, the images that each of us perceives them in different way. But I thought that also um, you talked about the uh, pause of music in uh, Romeo's mind, the head, when uh, in the 1968, he sees Juliet, there's all this yeah. music going around and then suddenly the music stops to give uh, emphasis to, to her presence and beautiful presence and, and very, um, uh, you know, because of the, the, the dress she's wearing and, yeah. uh, and um, I've got another couple of questions on that, but I'll leave it for later. Maybe then I, I want to give uh, the, the audience a chance also to ask questions. But basically the, the music stops, he sees her and, and the whole film and the whole perception of um, it's kind of like, you know, falling in love, everything slows down, the music stops in his head. And that at the same time here, I think the water has got more or less the same... Uh, uh, effect because the water seems to really be slowing down the time um, and away from the mad party next door you know they, they see each other through the glass of this fish tank uh, and, and, and the water is you know when you go into water everything slows down you know uh, well they, you, they use the swimming pool because uh, in the 1986 film uh, because the balcony in the play is really just there to keep them apart mm -hmm which is a conversation we had with the Romeo and Juliet in the course of the last year, and the importance of keeping them back on the stage at the time when both parts would have been played yeah. by boys. Yeah. And you made me, you reminded me of something that I was saying. At the part where they meet in the Zeffirelli film, yeah. Zeffirelli tried to copy what um, they had done in 1936 film, where they had sprayed silver paint on the trees in the forest. Sorry, from Midsummer Night's Dream. They had sprayed silver trees in the forest and they threw silver glitter in the air so it would make it look more ethereal, more magical. In the banqueting scene, when Romeo meets Juliet, he threw gold dust, had people throw gold dust into the air to try and make it shimmer and look great. And it didn't work. No matter how closely you look at that scene, it does not work. You can't pick it up. In fact, it caused damage to cameras. One of the cameras belonged to a photographer from New York Magazine. She was there to cover the film, having seen the uh, rehearsal that we talked about earlier. And the gold dust got into her camera and ruined her camera. And she got quite annoyed with this. I went to see Zeffirelli and uh, demanded that he pay for it. And he was okay with that. And Zeffirelli at the time was talking to Michael York. And the girl who had the camera and Michael York ended up getting married. So <laughs> the banqueting scene for Romeo and Juliet ended up being a, a, a romantic love scene for Michael York and his future wife because the banquet scene didn't work with the gold dust. That was, that was quite interesting. Okay. There's a little anecdotes that are always very interesting to, to know, to, to, to find out. Uh, but yes, but it didn't work for the film. And that was, I suppose that was what <laughs> the director really wanted. So um, yes, I, I just wonder if anybody else has got questions, if you want to unmute and ask a question. Um, and if I have one or two more, I'll ask them towards the end maybe. Is anybody there that would like, or you can type it 
uh, if you want, um, and I can read it out. Right. Uh, 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 unless someone's got a question, I've, I've got another one then. Okay, fire away. Right. Okay. So um, I'm going to start from an appreciation because there was a lot of um, comparison and influence between uh, in in the various uh, films, especially <laughs> the first three um, between art. Done, done either in a in a proper way and in a in a well researched way or not so well from my viewpoint in the Castellani version. It was not a little bit yeah. yeah, of um, you know, for example, the uh, the cathedral in Verona is the Gothic cathedral in Siena are mixed up. Yeah. And and I, for someone, you know, I mean, I know my country fairly well, and so immediately I, it was just like uh, what. You know, this is now Verona. Also, because I come from Padova, which is next to Verona, and so I know Verona <laughs> fairly well. Um, and that, but I really like, I really like this. Um, you know, this research, whether it's done badly or not uh, by the film director, I thought that Zeffirelli for me was the one that was actually um, had worked best. In Certainly, the most uh, dramatic. Yeah. yeah. And also the less, you know, sort of um, less kitsch in a way. I don't like the word kitsch, but it's, you know, the Castellani is a little bit kitsch sometimes. It's a little bit overwhelming with um, uh, things and, and kind of wrong references as well. Like, for example, the uh, Frangelico's, um, you know, Annunciation, um, you know, which is all like, in, you know, I, I thought that was really bad, actually, by him. But I thought Zaffirelli's research was quite good. And what I'm interested in, um, and probably that's why the 1936 film didn't work so well for me, for costumes, for example, was the fact- And the studio that, setting, the studio setting was, uh, I mean, it's, it's a good yeah, example of Hollywood yeah. movies of that time, what yeah. it was before. The, it was, so what interested me was the fact that, you know, obviously the Renaissance in Italy, we're here in Italy in the Renaissance, um, maybe England as well, uh, France and whatever else, but also the Middle Ages that everybody describes as the obscure centuries and years, which I think were actually very colorful instead. You know, we need to mm. reappreciate. And, 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 and if I'm not wrong, there's um, the story, the first uh, um, staging of Romeo and Juliet uh, in Italy, I think it was done in 1476 or something like that, which was a kind of um, mid, kind of late Renaissance. And then obviously Shakespeare is at 1597 or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, but all these reds and, and vermilion colors and strong colors that, you know, um, obviously uh, highlight her beauty, you know, Olivia Hussey's beauty and, and the rest and the and scenario and the, you know, the scene in Zeffirelli were well researched at the same time. Um, that's why that worked for me much better than the, you know, the Norma Shearer version, for example. Well, yeah, you have to remember that, and you'll know this, that Zeffirelli started out as scene painter for opera. Mm -hmm. This is where he met Visconti mm -hmm. and had a long personal relationship with Visconti, the new realist director. Mm -hmm. And Visconti told him early on, if people are look at something and they believe it to be real, Mm -hmm. They believe what is happening is real. Yeah. So this is why, and you're right, the, the, the sets for the Zeffirelli film are, are natural. You believe them completely. Yeah. Um, you don't really have that in anything. And some of the Lerman film deliberately goes out his way to make the whole thing yeah. kitsch. We can go into that later on. The 54 film tried too hard and they got to the locations, but they didn't do the work, you see electric cables running down pillars. Mm -hmm. You see uh, concrete traffic bollards. You see a magazine picture stuck to a wall. And there's a scene where uh, Benvolio is running down the street and he stops and looks left and right for traffic. No, you wouldn't do that, <laughs> you know, in 1600s or 1500s. So it's all a bit clumsy. Uh, so they, they, they try it maybe too hard because even the costumes yeah. and some of the costumes are just uh, ridiculous. The costumes know? are ridiculous, and there's no sword fights. We talked about this earlier on. Yeah. Uh, 
he seems to use daggers. We talked about Ferracorte, daggers drawn short hands, mm -hmm. which leaves out sword fencing is a huge part of Roman Juliet in the text in the film. Sword fencing is referenced throughout the play, and there's a theory, and I think it holds water, that in the original production, stage productions on stage, it's likely that the, the Montagues and the Capulets both used different styles of sword fencing, the Italian style and the English style. Sword fencing and dancing and theatre were the three arts which boomed through the time of Queen Elizabeth I. She favoured them, she was a very keen dancer herself. And sword fencing became, it became not just a sport, but a gentleman's sport, and it seemed to be artistic. And this is all in the play. Uh, and I think Cas uh, Castellani in 1954, he lost all that. Mm -hmm. There's virtually no sword fighting in the film at all. When Romeo kills Tybalt, we talked about this earlier, mm -hmm. he just runs up behind him on the stairs of uh, Siena Cathedral and stabs him in the back and then runs away again. <laughs> it's, you know, it's almost like a slapstick comedy. Yeah, yeah, and also not not very close to the original at all. No. It's a complete change of, um, um, yeah. Um, just wondering if someone has got questions um, that you would like to ask. I can see you there, Mary. Would you get a question for me? I don't have a question as such, Tony, but you know what? I've really enjoyed this, um, because I, I, mean, I have. I'm not. I'm not as a, as as cultured as as Rosella, but I've really enjoyed it because it's shown huge different aspects which someone who's less observant, like myself, wouldn't necessarily have picked up on. You know, um, but I, I also think that maybe some of the older films would have been limited as to what the actors could or couldn't do. You know, because they're always very staged about. There was always rules about one foot on the floor and, and you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, the, 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 well, that, the, the, the movies for limited. Film, yeah. That must have surely come across in some of the movies as well. Yeah, the 36 film, the, 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 the morning after the, the, we spent the night in Passion, uh, her hair is immaculate. There's not a hair <laughs> out of place. He's, he's fully close. He's got one foot on the floor. You know, mm -hmm. heads, it's, it's quite comedic, it's quite cool. And in contrast with that, you've got the, um, the brief semi-nude scene of 1968. Stories around that are, not sure how true it is, but um, it did cause the film to be banned in certain places, certain countries, Russia, certain other places. That scene was cut from a lot of places and certain states in uh, the American South. And the story is that Juliet, who had just turned 16, wasn't allowed into the premiere in New York because it had been given a higher grading. She wasn't allowed in for fear of catching a glimpse of her own breasts, which is quite funny. <laughs> Censorship going mad. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I have, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Does anybody else um, want to say something or have a question? Fred, do you have a question? <laughs> Fred, you need you're to... On, you're on, you're on, you're on, you're on. No, 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 no. Uh, Buonasera. Yes, uh, yeah. but, uh, yes I, I enjoyed it. I did, yes. Yes, I'm not a, I'm not by any means that I'm an armchair enthusiast or anything else, but I did I did enjoy the early stuff, the, the, the 1916 onwards to... I thought that was, you know, it's, it's my first um, toe in the water, if you like, looking at the, the book, the barb, and the various guises that you put forward. Um, I it's, too, it's, one, yeah. it's one of the most filmed plays, uh, Romeo and Juliet. There's countless short, um, silent versions, some comedy. There's one with um, Charlie Chaplin in it. And I think one of the earliest ones was around about 1905. It was French and it wasn't silent because they had, they had uh, recorded some of the lines on a Edison black cylinder. And they had tied this up, geared it up to the, the camera when it was rolling. So when they started the film, the cylinder started going to try and synchronise the short amount of speech. But we don't know how much of that was actually filmed. It may have just been one reel, it may have just been one scene, but it's all been lost. But it was, you know, it's quite benefit, benefit because the French early cinema has often been discarded for the more fashionable Hollywood given the limelight. But the French did an awful lot in the early days of cinema 
uh, to bring it forward. Sorry, bit of a diversion there. No, that's really interesting because, um, it, it, you know, not many people know this about the um, the not silent, silent film. Either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, it would actually be really interesting to see uh, if they're still available. Um, no, they... most of them are lost. I mean, you say lost, the films were made with um, it was acetate film. Acetate, yeah. And that gave extremely sharp images, particularly black and white, you have to remember black and white. Acetate gave great definition between you'll see modern flat screen televisions and they'll give you uh, they'll give you so many different gradients of black you could get something very similar in the early acetate films that's why they used it but the problem was that as acetate as the film aged the acetate began to decompose and became highly combustible and if it was exposed to oxygen and all these films were stored in warehouses that belonged to the film companies so when one of the films combusted, it was like a magazine, it was like an explosion in a, an ammunition dump. Mm -hmm. All the other films exploded along with it. So countless, countless silent films, when they say they're lost, they don't mean that someone put it down in a train somewhere and forgot about it. That means they've been destroyed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the Fida Barra film, and that's been lost, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, both of them lost. Yeah. You know, uh, it's a shame. It's a shame when any film's lost, but that was the first, the Francis Bushman film is the first full length, not full length, but eight real film, which was quite, quite significant at the time. Got up to that point, there were a lot of short films that tended to be clips of stage shows and tended to be actor managers showing off how great they were at being kings, the great imposing king characters. And in late Victorian time, it was not altogether unusual to have an actor manager playing Romeo opposite his own daughter, his Juliet. Right. Which is quite strange when you think about it nowadays. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's um yeah, I really, really, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, I mean, I would have another 115 questions to ask you, but I think that... Oh, is that the time? <laughs> <laughs> We've been here about an hour and a half, so maybe it's time to close and then we, we look forward to the next four lectures where you go deeper, maybe into each film, we were thinking, oh, yeah. I were thinking of maybe doing them over a year, maybe one per yeah. season. Yeah. So the next one could be sometime in uh, late summer or autumn. Yeah. And, and we'll talk good. about it. And, um, and what, what we're doing is uh, the things that we touched on here briefly, we will touch on them, but there will also be other things. And what we've touched on, we'll go into it in more depth. Uh, but you could do virtually a PhD on any of these films. The 2017 film, Romeo and Juliet, I don't like at all, uh, partly because it's a lot of the dialogue, a lot of the dialogue is taken out and put in by Julian Fellows, the guy who wrote Downton Abbey. But also at the same time, on the plus side of the film, it's not really meant to be a, a full serious take on Romeo and Juliet. It's, it's been made as an introduction for youngsters to get into Romeo and Juliet. Right. You'll find with that 2017 film, uh, people who liked it tended to be 11, 12, who were watching this for the first time. Right. And it was set up as more tribal, more action, and it hooked them, which was what it was supposed to do, and it was good. Yeah. But there's other versions, there's, there's very good, there's a, an excellent film called Ram Leela, which is an Indian film that's an adaptation of plot not an adaptation of text and you get these throughout the world so loads and loads of films yeah. but we just limited it to these four just and and also i wanted to say to everybody who's here <coughs> that um you know um amazon prime has all four of them available for renting if you want to watch them uh, on Amazon Prime, so then it's just the Roman Julie 1936, 54, 1968, and 1996, and you can watch them, uh, maybe one at a time, and you know before the next lecture or something like that. But they're really, really enjoyable. And watching them all together like I did on the week when I wasn't well. That was a bit that's intense. Really, that was brilliant. No, no, that was brilliant because as well as uh, then, obviously my favorite one was the Zeffirelli one. Um, and I also managed to watch on YouTube the. Um, Jesus of Nazareth by the yeah. early, the 1977 one which I watched yeah. as a child in episodes 
because Olivia Hussey plays uh, Mary of Nazareth. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, 10 years have gone by and she's exactly the same, just as yeah. as when she was 15, 16. Um, and so um, it, it was an enjoyable week for me, although I wasn't well, but at the same time preparing for this talk as well, because um, um, I thought that, you know, Tony was putting a lot of work in there and thought I should put just as much, you know. Yeah. You were saying it was interesting about four different films. Uh, one of the teachers at Broughton High has asked me to do a talk next term on Macbeth. And I, I said, have you got Macbeth? And she said, no. I said, well, I'll give you what copies I have of Macbeth, different versions, so you can compare, perhaps look at one scene, seeing how it's interpreted in different films. And much to my surprise, I have seven versions of Macbeth. <laughs> wow. You mean Macbeth, the, the play or the film? Yeah. Well, some of them are films and some of them are uh, ad film adaptations of stage productions. Okay. okay. Which, which um, I mean, the most ones from Macbeth are the... The Orson Welles one, yeah. Uh, uh, the Rowan Polanski one, the new one that's coming out with Denzel Washington, I haven't seen that yet. There's no date for the release of that, I'm looking forward to that. But there's other ones, stage productions by uh, Anthony Sher, which is excellent, Patrick Stewart, and of course, Sir Ian McKellen uh, has one with Judy Dench. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different versions out there. That's really good, um, interesting. Look forward to that as well, actually. And, uh, and then when when we get to the stage of <coughs> talking about the 1968 Zeffirelli version, I also ask you a question uh, and make some appreciation on a really good actor that really, really touched me with this playing, which was uh, John McHenry, who plays yes. in that one. I thought he was brilliant. I thought he was a really, really good... Um, I thought he was brilliant. I wrote to him to see if he would let me interview him, but he didn't write back. Yeah, I know, all right. So he's, he, he came down a notch. <laughs> Well, we can write again with Ian C. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, that fountain um, scene and then his, uh, his death, uh, I thought it was a masterpiece. Very, very beautiful. And I know from, you know, because on YouTube, you find all these sorts of things, like some interviews of uh, with um, Olivia Hussey and Leonard uh, Whiting when they were young and then when they were better, mm. old, you know, a couple of years ago. And I learned a lot of the way they worked with Zaffirelli. And apparently they, they said that working with Zaffirelli was, was amazing, was really, really good. And Zaffirelli, even when they had something to say, look, I don't really agree with this, you know, what shall we do? Zaffirelli was never overpowering with them. They kind of merged their ideas together and worked really well in a fluid way, I thought. I thought that was, I mean, I never worked with a film director, so I don't know how, but, but I, I was quite impressed by the, what they were saying in, in the interview. So if you look around on YouTube, you'll find them very nice and pretentious young, you know, yeah. young people. He was 17, she was 16, 15. It's interesting that of all the cast that were in the Zeffirelli film, the one actor that Zeffirelli himself singled out for praise, unstinting praise, was Michael York. Yeah, all right. And um, when Michael York was offered to be part of the Zeffirelli film, he was taken aback that it wasn't the part of Romeo. Michael York had played Romeo uh, in Cornwall, at the opening of the theatre in Cornwall, uh, where Richard Burton had come to see him because he'd heard he was good and praised him and recommended him to Steph Rayleigh as an actor to look out for. So he praised Michael York. Michael York was about upset about getting the part of Romeo. Whiting got the part because he looked so good, but in his autobiography, Steph Rayleigh talks, it gradually goes on. The question is raised is, what happened to Leonard Whiting? And Zeffirel is not explicit about it, but he does say that Leonard Whiting was quite argumentative in a lot of the stuff. Why do I have to do this? What can we not, you know? And he, it became quite embarrassing because other more established actors like John McHenry, Michael York, they didn't have to be told to do something twice or they did something very well. So it may have been that he was a little bit more argumentative with directors, I don't know. Uh, Olivia Hussey had a, a very difficult life. She. Um, developed agoraphobia, extreme agoraphobia, couldn't go at all. Uh, she married Dean Martin's son, oh, yeah. who later died in a plane crash. And she was suffered from it. They had divorced at that time, but she was very upset by that at all. Uh, but she's done some some very good stuff. She did re sort of semi-retire from acting for a while. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I suppose if she went through difficult times, she probably would. Yeah. 
um, and then also, um, yeah, no, I was quite, um, um, I quite like the way they interviewed that they were very down to earth. And she's from Wimbledon in London, and uh, yeah, and he's, I can't remember what other area of London, but that, you know, it, it's quite interesting to see how the, the, the real actors are, as real people, you know. Oh, well, uh, it's quite interesting with that chemistry between the two of them because when Zeffirelli was casting for Romeo and Juliet and they had hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people, yeah. he paired them off. Yeah. And Leonard Waiting and Olivia Hussey were paired from the very beginning. Yeah, that's what they said. Yeah, that's they, they only ever rehearsed with each other. They never rehearsed with anyone else. Yeah, they, they were chosen. That, that's what they were saying in the interview, that they were picked together because there was a, a sort of um, um, energy between them that was working. Yeah. And both of them have had um, experience at the theatre, especially he was studying theatre and she had had some experience in... Uh, Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Oh, that's right. The Prime of... Uh, that's yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, oh, well, so... Okay, so unless someone else has anything else to say or ask, <laughs> we probably will close it here. Okay. And, uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. We will keep you informed of um, the next episodes, uh, the, the next the, the lecture on the 1936 film. You were going to mention the journal. 